Thank you very much indeed. Well, let's crack on. Um, you, you mentioned at the end of your presentation uh, cyber risks and, um, and, of course, the Internet of Things, which we'll come to in a moment. But if I can just start with Jane, where does that fit in? Where does the cyber risk aspect of geopolitical risk fit in to what we've been hearing about where the potential conflict flashpoints are? I, I really enjoyed your, your presentation. That last bit, I thought... You know, it, it, it painted such a bleak picture, you know, and I, I came away thinking, oh my gosh, you know, this is the state. You know, I frequently go out and speak to audiences about where, where we are, you know, the attacks are getting more sophisticated. We have a very, very difficult landscape. You know, certainly from a business perspective, you know, we are, uh, you know, we've got new technologies coming through like the Internet of Things and cloud. Everything is connected and more is, is becoming more connected as we go forward and technologies are increasing. But we have, um, so new technologies, we have legacy systems, and then we also have non-electronic systems as well. And then we have things like regulation. So we have regulation like the, the GDPR, which is coming through next year, which really kind of makes it so much more challenging for us. And the real issue, I think, is that certainly from a cyber security perspective in terms of protecting businesses, we're there not to protect everything. We can't do that. We can't secure everything. We have to do that in line with the business, in, in line with the business's appetite for risk. So for us, it's about mitigating the risk and really looking at, you know, where are the threats, you know? Okay, well, let's come in more detail to that. But I was intrigued by... Um, there's a cyber attack been going on now, in case you haven't been reading the news. Um, but there's a link to Ukraine. And I just wondered what, why specifically Ukraine, and can we link it to conflict there? Potentially, actually, with, with regards to that, it's just come out. So I haven't actually... Yeah. Uh, it's still being... But my, my fundamental question is, is there a link between military conflict and cyber conflict? Or would you say that it, it is... Uh, the two, I mean, for example, a nation that is in a situation where it's in conflict, is it more vulnerable? Yeah, I would definitely say so. And yeah, it's, it's, I was with Paddy Ashdown the other night having dinner with him. And literally we were talking about, you know, the, again, the, the landscape, what is, what is coming and the wars will be won, you know, through, through, cy through cyber. Yeah. And I think one thing that's really interesting there is it doesn't have to necessarily be the militaries themselves. It can also be proxies. We saw, I think it was in the Netherlands, where they uh, basically disallowed a, a protest by the Turkish uh, individuals in, in favor of the referendum. And all of a sudden we saw attacks against government ministries there made by proxies themselves. And it's possible here, I mean, I have no idea, but when we see situations like Ukraine, it doesn't necessarily have to be the Russian uh, military that's conducting these operations, yeah. it's people who say, like, you know what, this is a good idea, and I can't believe that they're doing this. Let's go ahead and utilize them. We're going to focus it on Ukraine. Okay, Grant, let's come to you. Would, you, um, would your assessment of where the flashpoints are be consistent with what you've been hearing, um, particularly from John? Yeah, most certainly. I, I think there are, there are two real underlying themes we're dealing with. Um, I think the first one is Brexit and the uncertainty. I think the other one is most certainly with the respect to the Americans, what Donald Trump's going to do. Um, I think if you are a credit or risk manager in the current climate, good luck. Um, I think you are needing to be very much a chess grandmaster because the shocks that you traditionally saw 20, 30 years ago when you dealt with the nice guys, i.e. the Commonwealth, and the bad guys were people who were at war or didn't speak English, I think has become very, very apparent through globalisation. And I think the... Um, economic downturn of 2008, 2009 really brought in just how small the world is. So I think what we saw from economic risk of um, basically uh, fiscal measures to try and control economies, I think the um, uh, limited uh, disposable incomes, which then turned into political risks, which turned into the lack of investment in infrastructure, and it's what we're now seeing now. And um, I think the, the focus on BRICS was really interesting. Um, I like John's point about, um, you know, Belgium perhaps not being so safe. I don't think we know where the safe partners are anymore. It evolves very, very quickly. And we talk, those that have done this a long while, and there's a few people here with grey hair like me who've done it, it really is the domino effect now. Um, there's all sorts of things that can destabilise trade, whether it be from pure credit, through pure political risk or whatever. And onto the cyber thing, if I take it at a very simple level, I'm the person that does control-alt-delete, and that's the extent of my uh, technical IT knowledge. 
but, but I, I really do think there are huge reputational and fraud risks here. So knowing your customer at the end of it is most certainly one of the most challenging things. And it's no longer just the email from Nigeria. Mm. It's a lot more serious than that. OK, um, let's come to uh, where the flash points are. Let's, you know, I think it would be quite good if we could um, sort of work on geography for the time being, even though that's rather challenging. You've, you've both of you talked quite extensively uh, about the US. Um, the US spending on, on military has been, actually as a percentage, has been falling, has it not? The as a percentage world, of the yeah, world, yes. Yeah. Uh, as a percentage of the world, but that's because other people have been spending more. I mean, the right, and notably China has been spending yeah, more. China, China's been spending more. Uh, I mean, the US, the US budget's been uh, stagnant since 2009, 2010. In your pack, you'll see I put a little explanation of the um, US budgetary okay. system, which has meant that they actually haven't had, they haven't had money for extra money for defence preparation. They've had extra money for defence operations. John, what is, what if, if one is trying to predict, what you're trying to do is draw a line between presumably uh, political tensions and trade tensions as part of that, obviously, and then therefore the potential for conflict. Is there... Is there much, is, to what extent is there a correlation? How do you begin to predict where there could be conflict and where not? What factors contribute to that? Well, I think generally when you think of major trade partners, the, the idea that you're going to have a, uh, a major war with the United States seems relatively minor. I don't think they're going to get into a war with China. I think what you could, you know, but the, the, again, the, the counter to that is if you do... No, but the, the, the link is with North Korea, isn't it? I mean, presumably uh, Trump realised the link with North Korea. And what's astonishing about the narrative that you give, mm. and, and it certainly appears this way from the outside, yeah. is things that were fairly clear to everybody else appear to dawn on Donald Trump a bit later. Mm. <laughs> he, when I interviewed him, and I've interviewed him twice, and this was in the uh, early noughties, I think. I was living in the States. He... Um, it, it, it was extra it's quite extraordinary because he gives this very uh, this aura of self confidence and the story in his view sort of becomes true as he's telling it and that particular time he was talking about property prices and it was all going to be terrific and all of this this was just before the financial crisis of course and then he said to me and by the way you've got a couple of grey hairs that need sorting out there <laughs> <laughs> it's very typical very typical very he typical did the same the way thing with Larry King when he told him he had bad breath. Right before the end, he wants to put you a little bit off guard. It really depends on how he's trying to butter you up or if he feels like he has to take you down a, a peg. And if he feels like you're actually trying to show him off or like you're trying to upbridge him, he'll sit there and he'll be like, wow, that's kind of a weak handshake, isn't it? Right? And so it just kind of puts you off balance. And then therefore, when the negotiations begin, you're keeping thinking about, wow, is my handshake really weak? Yeah. Right? And therefore, he feels like he can take advantage. I don't think it necessarily always works for him, but that's certainly the approach that he takes. Okay, but the, the, the confusion that we have from a um, political point of view with Donald Trump, as you rightly say, is you're doing exactly what you do, which is watching the advisors and who they are sort of swim around him in what direction they might try to yeah. take him, to what extent they become isolated and so on. It's a very uncertain ship, isn't it? Absolutely, because the thing is you never realize when he's going to decide to actually do something. Because ultimately at the end of the day, I mean, when you look at the presidency, is that, and North Korea is a great example of this, it's really the generals that are leading on this policy. But when all of a sudden the generals start to disagree with themselves, it's going to be Donald Trump who has to make that decision. And if he hasn't done his homework, there's a possibility that he's going to make the wrong decision. And I think that's where you see increased uncertainty. It's not that he's going to lead the world into World War III. It's that he inadvertently kind of falls himself in a situation where he doesn't necessarily know how to handle it. And he's an individual who's prone to escalation. He have not really seen it on the geopolitical scene yet, but that's certainly in his character. Jane, it was very interesting. I thought the point that uh, John made was that there isn't much recourse against cyber attacks. Mm. Um, would you agree that that is the case, that really it's... Um, it's almost the unseen enemy and, and the unidentifiable energy yeah. enemy. Yeah, ab absolutely. We don't know what the, what the attackers look like. So, and, of course, the U.S. Is a, is a famed target for this, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, in U.S. military doctrine, they've now said that a military response could be justified by a cyber attack. Okay. Now, we've not gone that far uh, yet, but that's, they've written that down, and I think... I mean, this is, this is a very complicated world where 
uh, every cyber attack generates a lot of lessons, as I'm sure Jane knows. So, you know, you, it's quite difficult to work out how much is devoted to being to learning about what the people can do, <laughs> as opposed to just mm. going, "Wow, you know, this is this terrible attack." There is an issue about cyber, which is that it's the opposite of combat aircraft. That the the, the entry barriers into the cyber business are very low. You know, you don't. You, it's one smart kid with a few computers. That's completely different to most weapon systems, and mm. that's why it's disrupted. Now, you, you know, some of it can be individual people, some of it can be state-sponsored, mm. but um, and the gap between them is very difficult to pick out. But the entry barriers are very low, and that's a real remarkable difference compared. It's really interesting. We were talking about that before, and and certainly our industry is not it's not a profession yet. So anyone, anyone with any skill or even kind of interest in it can come in and they can work in whatever field they, that they want, whether that is you know, on, the, on the good side, you know, where, where I am, or on the, on the bad side as a cyber criminal terrorist or... If we're soldier. talking about the United States, is it possible to cat categorise what sort of attacks might be made and why? Or is sometimes the incentive, uh, rather, or the end goal? rather difficult to identify yeah it, it, it just it just depends I mean it's a big country with lots of business there so it really depends on what the objective of what the objective is I think it's really interesting to look at the US though in, in terms of their investment you talked about the defense budget mm. you know so looking at it almost from a, from you know how are they developing their talent you know from the innovation from the manufacturing, specifically with regards to, to cybersecurity professionals, you know, because they are leading the world in terms of that. They're doing a, a much better job than, than the rest of the world. We were hearing the point a bit earlier on that um, there was a reason, and you were linking it to the financial crisis, as to why we are seeing a spate of cyber attacks now. You do have to ask the question when you see it, why now? I d yeah, I, I can't answer that. I don't know. I don't know why now. I just think that technology is advancing. It's, it's, but is it's there something to do with server capacity? Is there a technological reason? Is it, is it, as you say, the Internet of Things whereby we can connect more? Is there's nothing, or would you say that it's, it's political shifts? Is there anything that we can link it to? No, I, 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 don't think there's any, I don't think there's any one thing. I think it's just happened. Technology is advancing. The means are becoming cheaper and more available. We've got the dark web. You know, anyone can do it. You don't have to be skilled. You can just pick up a tool, you know, for $28, you know, and actually launch, launch an attack. Or not necessarily an attack. It could be de to deface, to disrupt. It doesn't have to be to steal. I mean, I, you know, there's, a, there's quite a track record of uh, Russian attacks that, that were affected against Estonia, against Georgia. And I think there are, you know, within the sort of Putin way of thinking, um, that they feel this is something that they're going to play at. And I think there's also a kind of copycat phenomenon that you get with any uh, criminal or, or terrorist attack, you know, that because one group does it, somebody else is tempted to do it. Uh, and, and that's going to continue. What I thought was interesting, though, was that the attack that affected, you know, the health service a few weeks ago also affected Russian health services. There were a lot of Russian hospitals mm. affected, which showed that their vulnerability yeah, uh, is, is significant. Their dependence on IT is perhaps greater than we thought. I thought that was a, an interesting thing. But definitely there is, there is state-sponsored Russian, there is state-sponsored Chinese. Yeah. Uh, a company I know of said they, they track attacks and they, they, they start at half past eight in the morning <laughs> they stop at lunchtime, and they start again after lunch, and they stop at five o'clock. How civilized! And they and, the, yeah. and they've yeah, got a building. They know they, where they're coming from. They, they operate like businesses. They have support contracts. You know, they are suited and booted. You know, these are extremely professional organizations. They they collaborate. They give to gain. You know, all the time. They work so effectively. Grant, when you're assessing risk, how do you? begin to put cyber risk into any sort of mathematics because it's very difficult, isn't it, to, to try to, to say how large or small it is because it appears very random. You're absolutely right, it's very difficult, it so I, I won't answer that. <laughs> but, uh, but, but what I will say is I, I take it a slightly different angle. I, I think the, um, I remember the Y2K dilemma and all the crisis of that. 
Yeah. Um, I think the internet is really quite interesting in terms of, um, uh, should we say, behavioural economics, to use a buzzword from earlier. Mm -hmm. Simply from the point of view, it gives transparency and visibility. And if you look at China at the moment, one of the problems in China is being encountered in the textile and clothing sector. And it's to do with the labour rates in that market. And what it's doing is open up great visibility. So what we've seen is an evolution from, let's send everything to Asia, to you know, uh, India, et cetera. And then as the middle classes evolve in these areas, <coughs> they're actually getting access to the internet. They're seeing that in the, the Western world, you can earn 100 times what they're earning. And that causes social unrest. And I think this is where it's starting to magnify out. And so you're seeing changing dynamics. I also think as well the, the development of, um, and I've read it, I don't know anything about it, but artificial intelligence. So you can see a whole evolution there where computers become more and more sophisticated in the work they can do, which is going to impact on the service sectors in India, uh, particularly in terms of migration of, of workers, etc. So I won't comment on the cyber uh, structure, but that's my answer. Okay. Um, now, I want to talk a little bit about the Middle East, because obviously in the last few years it's becoming the... Well, more than the last few years, it's becoming... Um, very, very clear indeed that um, there are enormous divisions in Qatar. You mentioned Qatar, uh, it, divisions in the Middle East, and how we would choose to put a structure on that. Is, is, there, is, it, is, is some sort of pic consistent picture emerging whereby we can say where things are heading or where we're going to end up? Anybody? Uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, I think that uh, I'm, I'm not a Middle East scholar, but I, I do think that Generally, I mean, I don't want to say the worst is behind us because I don't necessarily want to say that. Because I, I do think that the, the divisions within those societies still exist. The divisions between the religions still exist. Within yeah. the ethnicities still exist. And again, the economic dislocation and inequality within those societies are also going to cause instability going forward. That said, we do see pockets of optimism there, and I think they need to be highlighted, whether it be with Saudi Arabia, UAE, or elsewhere. Don't necessarily think that what they're trying to achieve on foreign policy vis-a-vis uh, -vis Yemen and elsewhere is necessarily conducive to a stable environment. But at least you start to see the outspread that not necessarily we have to have a, uh, a cultural war between the West and Islam. I think the, the biggest thing on the immediate front is what's going to happen with Syria after we see the Islamic State basically lose control of Raqqa and lose control of Mosul. Where do those guys go? They're probably going to go in that border region. But even then, now we have, we're contesting for power there, and we're not exactly sure who's going to get armed, whether it's the Kurds, the rebels there, and then how those forces are end up going to end up fighting the government. If we don't have a political situation there, the possibility of a major conflict is certainly on the card. And from the perspective of the West, it is the potential for political vacuum, which is the risk. Mm, exactly. Right. So now we've sorted out the Middle East. Um, let's go on to Russia. Um, as I was saying earlier, I did a lot of um, filming in Russia some time ago, and it was very clear then just, just how dysfunctional it is. Um, and again, that is, creates a vacuum into which um, other things can go on in terms of cyber security. But where, where do we see US-Russia relations heading? Uh, Trump, as you rightly say, started off with a fairly um, optimistic view of what could be achieved, but has significantly backed off that now, obviously. Yeah, well, I think if you look, I mean, I, part of the whole idea, I, we always see when new presidents come in, they want to reset relations with either China or with Russia. And then if you look at it from a geopolitical perspective, they have very different interests in mind. And so I think that's how we approach this new rapprochement with U.S. and Russia, is that they're like, oh, they're going to be best friends now, they're going to work on terrorism inside the Middle East. And you're like, wait a second, they're completely divergent on Eastern Europe, Central Europe, the Caucasus and elsewhere. How are these folks going to get aligned? So very difficult to go down in the move that he was going. I mean, the only advantage that you could have, aside from Syria, is it's hard to imagine things getting much worse. Right? So there is the possibility over time that tensions begin to cool a bit, and you can actually see some type of benefits. That's what I'm saying is really look towards July. How does this meeting transpire between Putin and Trump? Is, is, is Putin able to offer anything to Trump that he could then bring back to Republicans back home and say, hey, listen, maybe we need to kind of calm the temperature down a bit? Mm. I mean, the big problem with, with Russia is to do with the Baltics, that uh, the Baltics were taken into NATO when there was no uh, threat Right. from Russia, and that's changed. And uh, in bull terms, the, the Baltics are pretty much indefensible in... in and there's some very strong lobbying from the Baltics for more support. They, they are... 
indefensible from a military point yeah. of view. They're too small, they're too flat. Yeah. It's just not possible. So, but what NATO's trying to do is reinforce its credibility and the credibility of its commitment by stationing people and sending uh, people there on location and having exercises there. And this is now irritating the Russians, so the Russians are, are responding. And, and I think getting some kind of uh, uh, understanding about the Baltics would be uh, a very positive advance, very difficult advance in terms of Western-Russian relations. Yeah. I mean, it's the Baltic, it's Ukraine, right? It's Georgia, it's one after the other. You know? So I mean, yeah. there's a lot of But they're, there. They're, they're not NATO members, and so they're less sensitive. And, and, and Ukraine, actually, you could, I mean, this is unfortunate, people of Ukraine, but it's tying up a lot of scarce Russian money, it's tying mm. up Russian effort. Same with Syria, actually, it's costing them money, it's costing them effort, they can't really afford those types of activity. So in a way, the, you know, the longer they go on, the poorer yeah. Putin becomes. Right, let's turn our thoughts then to China. So that's where we stand with Russia. I thought what was very interesting, and we'll come back to it, is, is this idea then that, that China's spending a lot more on military, uh, with the intention of doing what? Well, China wants... Uh, it, East Asia, as uh, I'm sure people realise, has, has kind of grown economically in the last 40 years, longer than that, uh, with the US providing a security assurance for all the parties in the region. And the US uh, Sixth Fleet, Seventh Fleet, has been able to go where it likes without any problem. And China has made clear that it, it at least wants to share... Uh, power in that area, and it, it in some you know some people believe it wants the U.S. to be out. Now there's a particular tangible problem, which is about Taiwan. That it, you know you have this situation in Taiwan that if the Taiwanese government says we are the rightful government of China, the government in Beijing says that's all right, we don't mind you saying that. But if they say no, we're an independent state, they say, you can't do that. We're going to invade you. Uh, so. I, the, the, the prospect of a, um, of a, a China-Taiwan confrontation, the American ability to protect Taiwan is now being significantly reduced. And the tensions over the Spratly Islands, of course. Well, those are, those are, those are <clears throat> part of that is that the United States, I don't think, can take the lead on that. <laughs> because unless the, it's the other state claimants so we, should we just take a step back and say it's because this area is a major trade route, seven percent or something of world trade? It's a large percentage. I think. I mean, they, some people very. Some people say that China is not really interested in the resources. They're interested in the physical presence. They're interested in the, you know, they're in building. The South China sea. Yeah, they're built in the South China Sea and East China Sea. They're building uh, a significant navy. They're, they're trying to build aircraft carriers um, at the same time as they have the means to sink aircraft carriers, which is quite an interesting political move. Uh, but if the, if the local states, if the Malaysians, if the Philippines, if the Indonesians, Indone if they don't make a big fuss about the South, South China Sea, it's very difficult for the Americans right. to do that. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I mean, I think that if you look at the, the construct of that standing committee, if you look at the, the recent presidents that we've had in China over the last few decades, you know, I think there's a realization that the idea of the you know, Chinese Communist Party I mean, it's no more the, the Chinese party, right? It's no longer communist, certainly some state-led growth. But the idea is, is that you really have to focus on issues of nationalism. And, and what's the proper place of China inside the world? And so one of the things they did is they almost settled almost all of their border issues, the land issues. But those vital sea lanes, what they really find is that this is our vulnerability. Right? Part of the whole idea of this whole one, uh, the One Belt, One Road project decrease that vulnerability with trade, and then on top of that, have those sea reeds open. I agree with you. It's, it may be future resources, but a lot of it is making sure that they can, can secure themselves, and therefore they need to have that territory, at least the viability, to have goods entering and exiting that area. Grant. Yeah, I, I think, um, I won't add to that because I can't, <laughs> um, but I think the, the, the risks in, in, in China, Julian touched on it earlier, I think the um, the level of growth in China is, is much subsided to what it was four or five years ago. And I think that brings huge problem with corporates who are clearly highly leveraged. Um, I think the other thing that we've not spoken about in, in China is the uh, shadow banking area yeah. where the transparency on the numbers coming out of China, I think has to be questioned. Um, and I think without state intervention, as uh, was mentioned earlier, 
to, to should we say, shore up the economy last year. The, the Chinese government, whether they'll support it again this year or in the immediate future, I think will also be questioned as well. Mm. So there's some uh, uh, still good growth, but some underlying trends that are not great. We're galloping around the globe. Does anybody have any questions? Please do put your hand up if you, um, if you want to ask something. Yes. Yes, please. Thank you. Uh, Ian Gunn, PIB Insurance Brokers. Uh, one of the countries that John touched upon in his presentation and is of particular interest to us, and I suspect a number of other people in the audience, is Iran. Yeah. Um, if we set aside for the time being the lack of support within the UK uh, banking sector and government for trade with Iran, which we could probably talk about for the rest of the day, <laughs> uh, one of the major concerns, obviously, for trade with Iran has been the potential threat of OFAC sanction and also the US uh, attitude to Iran going forward. On Friday, we saw Total, who have always expressed a reservation about investment into Iran, commit to a one billion US dollar um, venture with National Iranian Oil Company for the South Pars development. Um, is that suggesting then an improvement in the perception of Iran at a corporate level as a risk, or with the announcement towards the end of this week of US attitude towards the Middle East, are we expecting to see an improvement in US-Iranian uh, relationships? John, improvement in relations uh, with Iran or perception of Iran? No. Uh, okay. <laughs> Next. Uh, <laughs> that was my answer. <laughs> yeah, uh, you know, I, I, when, it, when it comes to it, I mean, I, partly it's because anything that Donald Trump sees of Obama, it's automatically dismissed. Right? Whether it's the, the nuclear deal, free gift, $150 billion for Iran. So I think Partly it's that mentality, but again, I think it's partly he himself doesn't know about the situation, so he's letting kind of hardliners within his government kind of dictate this policy. And the traditional policy of Republican hawks towards Iran has been, this is an evil regime, it's a, the a theocracy, and it's ultimately intent on mischief inside the region. So anything we can do to counter it is going to be a benefit for U.S. national security. The problem is, is that we have all these different constraints and this or whatever. I think at the end of the day, though, what you find is that the idea of some type of unintended escalation could lead to real advancement, not necessarily of a military confrontation or limited military confrontation, but more likely, again, more sanctions, more sanctions, more sanctions. So I think it could be a, it could be a road towards, in other words, overall, it's not as bad as it was, but it's certainly not headed in the right direction. Yeah, no. Fine. <laughs> I think Iran is a very complicated country, and it's a complicated picture. Um, it's one of the areas where, I, you know, I would say foreca forecasting, you've got to always have four or five possibilities in mind. And I, I think things are better since the nuclear deal, but they're not ideal. It's interesting that the French have done this. The French have <coughs> slightly uh, got a slightly different attitude to risk and th that type of deal. But I think it's a complicated. Code. I think a significant amount will be, you know, how over the next five, six years, the uh, Saudi perception of Iran. The, the, the fear of the Gulf states was that when Iran came off sanctions because of the nuclear deal, that Iran would get much more mischievous in the Gulf and much more assertive in the Gulf. And if that proves to be the case, then that's yeah. that's that's ammunition for the kind of hardliners in the U.S. If it doesn't prove to be the case, then. Yeah, I mean, certainly one of our major concerns with Syria right now. Yeah. So all of a sudden, the, you know, the hands are off. And also, you have a, it, it's internal dynamics within Iran itself. The IRGC and the Supreme Leader, to a degree, feels almost to save face. They've got to take a tough line on Syria. So all of a sudden, you have the increased possibilities. They feel really this need to defend Damascus. So you have increased hostility there. But then all of a sudden, like you said before, there's a vacuum there for the United States, mm -hmm. the Kurds and the Turks. And all of a sudden, you know, how does that transpire? It could transpire in a very violent way. Any other questions? Everybody's very quiet out there. Hmm. Yes, right at the back, please. Sorry, I didn't see. Hi, uh, Theo Varen from Marsh, political risk broker. Um, a bit of a follow-up question. So we've established that the US isn't going to really be changing their line, and even if they keep the nuclear deal, sort of sanction relief, they're piling them on for things like human rights abuse, uh, development of ballistic missiles, etc. New sanctions this week, right? The, the I mean, Senate, yeah. yeah. Um, what is the scope for the rest of the world to engage with Iran, even if the US, if not increases pressure, it, at least stays mute as they have, which has been a real frustration for banks? Because we see, for example, the Italians with Saatchi moving in, they found a mid-sized regional bank with no ties to the US to finance some things there. Is there any room for the rest of the world to move in, even if the US won't 
Bless yeah, ha there has been a feeling because of the banking issue that the U.S. has rather dominated um, the strategy there. Absolutely. I think that part of the reason why you see that's total agreement, you see other banks moving in, is this idea that they realize that this nuclear agreement, even if the U.S. begins to pull away from it, it doesn't mean that the rest of the, uh, the, rest of the world is going to do the same. And I think part of the reason why the U.S. has stayed in this agreement is they realize that they're out on their own on this issue. Mm -hmm. So that means there is an opportunity for other individuals to invest in there. The question is, is if there is some type of escalation, I mean, the U.S. can take draconian steps to, of course, basically remove them from the dollar, and then, of course, secondary sanctions on individuals that are operating there. I don't think it's going to go down that road, and I think most people realize that, and that's the reason why they're going in. Right, so we are getting dangerously close to lunch, so I'm going to ask all of the panelists once again what keeps them awake at night and how they see, um, how they see the level of risk that we are um, facing in the world at the moment. Is there a simple answer to that, Jane? <laughs> But in your world, this is, you know, it's the talent, you know, the, the, the talent that we have in, in cybersecurity and, and really growing that and making sure that the basics, those foundations are in place. That, that's what kind of keeps me. Yes, and I think it would be a surprise to a lot of women that um, a lot of people that, you know, somebody so senior in that field is a woman. Because I don't, you always hear that women are not attracted into that field. Yeah, well, we have, we have low numbers, and that's one of the reasons why I wrote the, the book that I, I'm just about to publish. So really, you know, that is another thing that does keep me awake at night because women are hugely um, needed in, in our industry because we see risk in a different way. Our, our brains operate in a different way to men's, and, uh, you know, it's, it's fact. You know, it's like we're, we're incredibly Possibly complex. better way. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not. It's, it's how it is, so, and it's good to be different. You know, in our industry, we need lots of different types of, of thinkers. So it's really getting more women in, different types of thinkers, you know, those who have got the creative thinking capacity, so aren't just purely from either the intelligence or the military or even the, the police or, or STEM, you know, STEM. It's, we need that creative, creativity so that we can see the blind spots. Grant. Um, I'll sort of paraphrase the great Donald Rumsfeld. The unknown unknowns keep me awake. Uh, from somebody who's mainly concerned with, with the sort of security and physical side, but the thing that, I mean, there are obviously big challenges outside, but Brexit is the, is the biggest, I think, threat to uh, UK security because of the threat to prosperity. And then if the, if the prosperity is there, we haven't got the resources. But, to deal with these wider issues. So, uh, and I, I find the whole, um, the, the way that Brexit's being approached to be the, the most alarming thing consistently day on day. You know, I think it's a combination. I think for me, cyber is huge. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it seems to me that the weapons are getting larger and larger, the attacks are larger and larger, and our capacity to be able to defend against them is still relatively modest. Hopefully we're gonna have same time by technological transformation that allows it to happen, but at this point we have it. And then number two is, I really do, I and mean, I did talk about it today, is I really am fearful about the idea of the populism movement that we're seeing really to take hold of various societies, not just the US, but really across the globe. And it's not so much that I feel like they're gonna lead us into World War III, but the idea of mischief, some type of violent altercation between rival powers. If you have something in a situation where all the government and all the ideology is based on one individual, the prospect for that individual to feel slighted, to feel that he has to or she has to react, has got to be in the cards. So I think the advice is go home, put your head under the duvet and stay there as long yeah, as you possibly can. Lovely. Thank you very much to all of you and over to us. <laughs>